when we take our courage and our baggage firmly in both hands. Well, fairly firmly anyway. We grasp our passports, visas, itineraries and tickets, and as normal, fallible human beings, we prepare to travel by air. We pay for our fares and our excess baggage, and by doing so, we rightfully take our place in a unique corner of history. The instaptijd is five minutes over one, the outcome B30. It's a relatively short history. Even less than 40 years ago, it would have been very unusual for anybody to travel a long distance other than by sea. And indeed, it is still possible to indulge in the slow and dignified, if somewhat boring, life aboard ship. For most people, though, serious travel means flight, a vast worldwide industry partly pioneered by one man. You have to come back in time to Holland in 1919, when a lot of influential men, many of whom had made a lot of money out of Dutch shipping, attended an air show. The gist of their conversation and their speeches was important. They said that if the Dutch could make money out of traveling to the far corners of their empire by sea, how much more could they make if they took to the air? The challenge was taken up principally by two men, an aircraft designer called Anthony Fokker and an ex-military pilot called Albert Plessman. It was Plessman on the right who brought into being the world's very first airline, the Royal Dutch Airline called KLM. So in 1920, with a chartered British de Havilland airplane carrying two passengers, Plessman pioneered the first regular route between Croydon in London and Schiphol Airfield at Amsterdam. Two very cold passengers and a few bundles of newspapers. A tiny beginning, and it happened here in Holland. Not only the first airline, but also the first aircraft built specially to carry a number of paying passengers. It was also Dutch, built by a man called Kohlhoven. And the passengers may have had a job getting in, but they were better off than the pilot, who never got in at all. Just over 60 years ago, but the progress has been almost unbelievable. Yes, goodbye. Thank you. Are you in the car to get tickets for our train? Yeah. Thank you. Already, we've begun to feel a little less human than we were, despite the cheery greeting. Would we take it all for granted quite so easily if we remembered how it used to be?
By the early 20s, Anthony Fokker was firmly on the scene in Amsterdam, delivering his F3 airplanes to KLM, followed by probably the most famous aircraft he ever designed, the F7. Although nearly 250 were built in the 20s and 30s, only five have been preserved, one here in the Aviation Museum in Amsterdam. Three hundred and fifty tons of aircraft, enclosing almost four hundred people. Strapped in, shoulder to shoulder, in a vast metal container, hurtling through the air to Singapore. Nineteen twenty-six, and by now, although the Dutch pioneers had flown their way to the Far East and back, this was the day that flying made its first move to compete with the shipping trade. Not that anyone realised it at the time over Rotterdam with the world's first aviation correspondent. The F-7 was on its way to cross France to Marseille, there to meet up with a Dutch ship which had left Holland more than a week before on its way to the Dutch East Indies. The captain of the Indrapura was to take on board five passengers and a lot of mail that would reach Batavia ten days quicker than ever before. As the mail was ceremonially handed over to the French post office, it was accepted that this was a historic moment. What nobody fully realised was that this journey represented the very first small nail in the coffin of sea transport. From now on, it was only a matter of organisation before the Dutch would inevitably take their passengers all the way to the Far East without the help of the sea. So, what would you like for hors d'oeuvre? Would you like some of the caviar? Still, like the old ships, here there remain different classes. The more you pay, the better you are treated, and the more you get. Hi. You're welcome. What would you like to drink with it? Just a glass of water? There were no such divisions in the old days. They were all wealthy, so there was no need to divide them. Darkness falls long before we expect it, and we try to reject normal consciousness as best we can in order to avoid the feeling that nothing around us is real. Hollywood helps. Two minutes, ten seconds. Enter room. What's happening? Ah! Ah! God, man, get out of there! Towards the dawn, the jumbo flies itself, not caring what lies below it, but precise about where it has been, where it is going, and exactly how long it will take to get there. From one radio beacon to another, the captain watches while the aircraft hisses on through the silent sky. No need anymore to take sights of the stars, Technology has taken over here, just as it has in so many other things that used to need human skill. There was a time when navigation and flying in general were regarded as an art, and perhaps in those days that was true. 
Budapest, the first stop on a 12-day flight to the Far East. After 1928, it was possible to fly all the way in an F-7, now fitted with two extra motors under the wings. Second stop, Athens. The F-7s, and by the early 30s, the F-12s, were safely transporting passengers who had the money from hotel to hotel across the world. Across the desert, with nothing but their own shadow to keep them company. But it wasn't always so dull. They flew low over the Sphinx, not just for the view, but because without pressurized cabins, they were forced to fly low. Dutch fuel in Cairo and another night stop. Past the line of oases, just to be on the safe side, and away over Jordan. Dry mountains to climb nervously over and on towards the Indian subcontinent, where at least they knew where they were once they'd arrived. With 16 passengers on board, the F-12 was a big aeroplane. One thing about flying in the early 30s was that there was a lot more to look at. And if you didn't see the Taj Mahal properly the first time, then the pilot would be happy to go round again. In those days, they even cleaned the windows. But then in those days, it was worth it. After all, there was plenty to see. Don't imagine that it was fun for the passengers and crew all the time. The Burmese jungle, for instance, that was another story. The flying there, over the jungle, was quite different from here because there were no radio, no radio aids, and uh, you couldn't do night flying there because of the night, night facilities, night landing equipment. The airfields were very small, and the jungle is much more an enemy than the country here in Europe. And the map we used, there's a map which I have here on my lap, you see that, and you navigate it on that map with your finger, sometimes keeping it crossed, but also keeping it on your heading. And sometimes when you had a very bad weather, you were blown off the map, and you say, well, my, my, now I'm off the map. Five-year-old Melanie lives in a wooden shack in a disease-infested slum in the Philippines. At night, she eats only a bowl of rice and goes to sleep on a floor mat. Melanie desperately needs nutritious food, medicine when she is sick, and a chance to go to school. Now, for only $12 a month through Children International, you can sponsor a child like Melanie who needs your love. Call the number on your screen and tell the operator you want to sponsor a child for only $12 a month. Choose a boy or a girl. Then, in just a few days, you'll receive an envelope to mail us your first month's payment. Your child will learn that her waiting is over, that you are her sponsor. And you'll have your complete sponsorship kit with your child's photo and her personal history telling you all about her, her health, and her family situation. You'll begin to know your child. You will also receive a special report about your child's country, answers to your questions, and more. During the year, you'll receive two personal letters from your child filled with love and gratitude. You are not obligated to write, but you may write as often as you wish and send birthday and Christmas cards, too. Through updated photos, reports, and letters, you and your child will grow closer to each other. You will watch her blossom and grow strong because of your love and all that your $12 a month is providing for her. Food and clothing, medical care, a chance to go to school, help for the family. You will see the difference you have made in her life. Decide now to take one special child into your heart and change her world with your love. Call now and become a sponsor. To become a sponsor for only $12 a month, call 1-800-334-4700 now 
That's 1-800-334-4700. Venture into the silent forest beneath the waves. Meet the diverse wildlife that lives among the kelp beds of the Pacific Ocean. Friendly seals, jellyfish, and playful otters all depend on the kelp for their continued survival. Join the Discovery Channel and journey into the fascinating ecosystem of the silent forest. Saturday nights at 10.30 Eastern, 7.30 Pacific. Sydney Ward Company President, Beautiful View. You're a pretty powerful guy. Oh, I do okay. But weren't you just seen pleading for change in the street? Why because you ran that? out of coins for the public phone? No, no, wait a minute. Sid, you need the AT&T card. Oh? With the AT&T card, you never need coins. Dial zero plus the number you're calling, then your card number, and your call is billed to your phone. Is that so? Now that's power, Sydney. Well, then it's me. <laughs> to get the AT&T card, dial 1-800-CALL-ATT. For the people of Burma, the sight of Europeans dropping out of the sky must have been nearly as strange as little green men getting out of a flying saucer. 1,440 litres, pumped by hand, and where there was no pump, they carried it up a ladder, can by can, 70 times. Twelve days flying across desert and mountains and jungle, past Thailand and Malaysia and over the Malacca Strait. And by the time they got to Singapore, they had beaten the ship by nearly three weeks. Even to this day, Fokker aircraft are flying over the same routes and many more. There are now over 750 Fokker friendships operating from every kind of airfield in every corner of the world. The Fokker Aircraft Company is the world's oldest aircraft manufacturer still operating under its original name. Though, when you look at the new F-28, it seems incredible that this highly sophisticated aeroplane should have come from the same people who delivered their aircraft through the streets of Amsterdam in the early 20s. Fokker entered the pure jet market in 1968 with the Fellowship. And again, with its ability to operate in any conditions in any part of the world, it's another success. But Fokker didn't always hit it off. He made one big mistake, this one. The F-36 was rolled out of the hangar in 1934 as the ultimate aircraft designed for the journey to the Far East. Total comfort for 11 passengers. But it came too late. The Americans had delivered the DC-2. Flying for KLM, this aeroplane came second overall and was the first airliner to arrive in the great race from London to Melbourne. Fokker had no chance of competing. The DC-2 turned into the DC-3 and was called the Dakota. No aeroplane has ever been so successful. It had a retractable undercarriage, a variable pitch propeller, and a lot more comfort for the passengers. And if you think that these aircraft also look like museum pieces, then you'd better look again. After almost 50 years, this same design is still earning its living against fierce competition, particularly from Fokker. it may have been, but in comparison with the old F-7, 
it was almost like a spaceship. The DC-3 changed the whole commercial aviation industry because it was the first reliable transport aeroplane. It was fast enough, about 170 miles an hour, to be largely independent of adverse winds. It carried full de-icing equipment and heating and therefore is able for the first time to operate in the sort of weather conditions that, that modern day airliners do. There were in all about 10,000 DC-3 C-47 variants produced, of which over 500 are still flying throughout the world today. Under the tropical sun of Singapore, the control tower is now in contact with the flight from Amsterdam. The equipment is also from Holland. It's the most modern tower in the world. Calamid 07, Singapore Tower, the surface wind 010 at 8 knots, continue approach. They listen through howls and squeaks for messages in Morse, picked up from stations far away, and the radios they used were often made in Holland. Connected to long wire aerials that trailed behind the aircraft, they worked but only rarely when there was a ground station to talk to. And some have survived, but you have to go and search for them in the cellars of the Philips factory in Holland. Strange to think that the people who made these also equipped the tower in Singapore. Kelly mid 07 is clear to land, runway 02 left. They were pioneers, the passengers as well as the crews. Perhaps the wonder is not that it took so long, but that they ever got there at all. And if they didn't know that they were making history, certainly they knew that they had achieved something new and exciting. For us, we leave where we entered. Only now we've lost all sense of time or distance. It might be Singapore or Honolulu, our throats are dry and our legs are shaking. If the airport looks exactly like the one we left behind us, it isn't really surprising, though it may be confusing. It was largely designed by the Dutch architects who built the airport at Amsterdam. Human beings no longer. We feel like rejects from a giant factory. We paid to travel, and we got exactly what we paid for. All of us have been gently processed from one end of the world to the other. You don't realize how far you've really traveled until you get away from the airport. Only 18 hours. Or would it be fair to say that it's taken us more than 50 years, and flying is still for the rich? So, if that's how it was, and how it is, what of the future? Well, judging from the past, all one can say is that what goes up doesn't always come down quite the way you expected. Final call for Qantas, flight QF-40 to Darwin. Passengers, please proceed to gate B29 for immediate boarding. <laughs>